Thank okay. you. That made me smile. Good. I'll just sit here quietly. You just smile and sit here and smile and be pretty. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Welcome everybody to Heroes of Improv. I'm Kira Tyson, an improviser, a teacher, and an associate producer of Duluth, the improvised soap opera, which is in full production training, as many of you already know, and will be airing mid-May. So describe or subscribe, I would say describe, subscribe now, right, to our YouTube channel because that's where we'll be airing. Um, so you don't miss the date, the start date. Um, it's a proper series, a proper soap, so you don't want to miss it. Coming up soon. Today, my super special hero <laughs> is not just one of my favorite improvisers in the world, but also a star cast member of the show Duluth itself, uh, which everybody is super excited about. So welcome with me today, Da -da, Lee White. Ah! Hello, everyone. Hi. Thank you for having me, Kira. You are welcome. <laughs> Lee, it's really a true privilege uh, to have you here, especially on this row, because you can't miss this row, even though you're cast member. This is important. Not Like I said, you really are. Um, an improviser that we, we would love to hear your voice on the questions that we have. So you can actually pretty much um, close your eyes and just relax, go back to sleep for the next two hours, because I'll probably just do a small introduction about you. And Did you say two hours? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> two hour introduction? Well, then stop doing so much with your life, please, with your improv life. You know, how, how else am I going to get this through? I'll, I'll try and be as quick as possible. So, but I just right. want to introduce you to, to, to the rest of the people out there uh, and the people watching. So, Lee White is uh, an actor, most known, of course, for his improvisation, his comedy stand up, but also uh, film. You do films and you do voiceovers. Uh, originally from Winnipeg, Canada, uh, now based in Berlin, Lee has become an acclaimed improviser for being part of the famous improv duo Crumbs, uh, which is an improvisational theatre duo, also based and founded in Winnipeg. I think it was in uh, back in 1997, six, seven, something like that, roughly a long, long time ago. Um, and you've toured in Europe more than any other improv act out there. Mm -hmm. no, probably. This is what the yeah, it's pretty amazing. The duo consists of you, Lee White, and of Stephen Sim. Um, Lee, you have been also performing and teaching improv pretty much or almost all your life, touring with shows and workshops all over Europe, Asia, North America for over twenty-three years. And your unique philosophy of improv has made you welcome. Um, pretty much everywhere you go. So we'll be talking about that in a minute. They, like, they, they yes. welcome me there. They don't always welcome me back, but they, they usually invite me once, that's for sure. <laughs> okay. Well, at least once. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you're too difficult to book. That's probably why. That's probably, it's probably, it's probably why. <laughs> they don't get you more than once. They, they should have if they get you more than once. <laughs> So aside from Crumsley, um, you've developed several um, new shows, obviously, um, such as The Knowledge of Punishment, Clever, the live comedy game show, Your 15 Minutes of Fame, and Paradigm with Joe Bill, The Laurel. Paradigm. Paradigm. I never know. Paradigm. Yes. Paradigm. It, it's, a, it's one of those words that looks more complicated than it is. Paradigm. Uh, paradigm, yes, with Joe Bill. With Joe Bill. Okay, Paradigm with Joe Bill. Then you've got the Laurel Lees, which is, uh, I always tell him, it's one of my favorite shows. I love it. I just laugh all the time. Um, within the Laurie. And you've got Winnipeg's uh, famous Dungeons and Dragons improv show um, and countless others, collaborations that you have with all over artists all over the world. I mean, it, it, the list just goes on. Since you moved back to Berlin, you've also been teaching regularly uh, at the Gorillas or with the Gorillas. Improv School. You perform regularly also at the Improv Embassy 
and at the Rati Boa Theater. You coach groups all over the world at major festivals also. Um, if they can book you quick enough again, then I would say you're just spending most of your life in hotels if it weren't for lockdown. <laughs> jumping from literally one city to the next. Uh, it, it's crazy for you. You've also been in many TV productions though, Lee. I'm sorry, I said go to sleep. You might as well just go to sleep, you know. <laughs> you know, maybe I'll just stick around and help out every once in a while, who knows. <laughs> exactly. Well, no, you have been in a few TV productions as well, you know, things like the Pinkertons and the Spides, as well as uh, other short films and, and movies. Um, and you also lend your voice uh, as a voiceover actor to characters in um, all over, yeah, TV, narrative image videos, advertisements, um, short clips, etc. This yes. much, yeah. I'm an, I'm an expert in voiceovers for commercials that never get produced in the end, but I get the paycheck, so I'm happy with it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> do you <laughs> it might have something to do with your voice? No, I don't think it does. Not, not usually. It's, it's probably because the choice you say yes to, right, where you find you have time for doing it, they're probably so dark and strange anyway that <laughs> the producers at the end think, Jesus, that was a great voice, a great actor, but can we actually do this? This is going to shock the world. And then they decide not to, you know. You should ask that material back, by the way. You should be like, hey, I want it. It's mine. <laughs> I, I have on a few occasions. <laughs> do a compilation. I was the best dog. I want that audio. <laughs> uh, speaking of compilations, you also just in March now recently, um, the Gorillas put on a, a mini festival, um, which actually I love the name from. It was Festival That Never Happened. Mm -hmm. So I, I love the title. Uh, and there you did a compilation, a film combination, where you sort of cut the last 20 years of the Berlin Festival together. And um, it was a retrospective video. That was, um, that was your compilation, right? So, so you made that. Yeah. I, I had also done a, a documentary on the improv festival or in, an improv project that had happened a few years ago called Our Lives. So filmmaking is something I'm just kind of starting getting into. Um, so right now I'm just practicing editing, but um, yeah, so that's another tool in my belt. Very good. Very good. We should be using you in, um, in the production more. No, I, I, I'm happy. This, this is one of the things I love about Duluth. I'm just one of the actors. I just get to sit back and have other people direct me. It's really nice. That's true. Um, currently, speaking of which, yeah, that's exactly one of the many projects you're doing and, and you've signed yourself up to is to push really um, new boundaries in exploring the possibilities um, of televised improv soaps which Duluth is, you know, uh, probably one of the first that's going for 24 episodes and um, the technical aspect, the way it's being produced, probably, yeah, the first of its kind. So that is a, a, an amazing um, thing and, and we are so privileged to have you as part of that exploration and um, love to see you help push those boundaries. So that's uh, cool. Yeah. cool. As, as cool as improv gets. Yeah. All right, first question. Um, all right, I let's, get you, let's get serious. Let's get serious. Is what is your unique philosophy you bring to the improv world? Just in two short sentences. Um, two short sentences. Don't don't count these ones. Um, I think when uh, we first started doing improv in Winnipeg, we didn't have influence from the outside world, so we kind of approached it more like a, a punk rock band. We we were this tight group and we wanted to do our thing and we didn't want to do things that were uh, out like other people were doing and we didn't want to follow the rules. Um, so a lot of what I teach through improv is saying like, here's the rules, now here's how we break them. And also encouraging improvisers to not rely on these, um, mm, let, let's call it the, the sort of mottos of improv, this yes and is, is totally um, something that gets misinterpreted and uh, people like rules and I think the fun thing about improv is that we shouldn't really need rules. Um, guidelines, maybe. Rules, not so much. So Would you say I, the same I, though for, for beginners? Um, yes and no. It's a matter of expressing to a beginner like here's the rule uh, that we're going to make for today, but this isn't a rule that stays forever. Mm -hmm. And 
um, if someone is approaching improv in the sense of like, hey, look, I just want to have fun with this. I'm not trying to be a professional improviser. Then I'm like, hey, cool. Here's some rules. Stick to these and you'll feel more successful and have more fun. But once you go past that and you want to start exploring improv and making it an art form that you play with, then I want artists to challenge those rules that we get taught as beginners. So yes, there's a place for those things. And at the same time, um, there's also a, um, a, a time to let go of those things mm -hmm. and, and move past it. Mm -hmm. Agree, agree, I agree. All right, thank you. Okay, so I don't need to ask you um, <laughs> if you're a dramatic improv player. We all know in the world that you are and that you pretty much embody um, exactly this art form. Uh, as soon as you step on stage, you know, that's you. Even if you step into a room, it's like there's no difference between whether you're on stage or you're off stage because you just seem to, to really embody it and it's, it's beautiful. Um, but today we want to talk a little bit about the differences between comedy improv, short form versus dramatic improv, sort of mid long form. Um, how do you infuse or translate <clears throat> into your performances or into your teachings? Um, well, without being argumentative right off the beginning of this, um, whether it's short form or long form, it's how you approach it and what you put into it. it, it one doesn't dictate the style. So you can have a short form scene that is absolutely dramatic and serious and has um, honest things to, to um, inspire the audience with. Um, and you can have long forms that are absolutely silly and absurd and, and don't really leave a um, lasting impression in the sense of a thought or teaching about life in a sense. So to me, the, the, the time of the improv show doesn't dictate what we do with it. It's your intention. And the sad thing is, is that when we go in front of the audience, we make jokes, we get instant feedback as improvisers, like you're doing well, you're doing well. When we do a dramatic scene and there's silence and there's in the audience and there's um, uncomfortableness, we feel like it's failing. And so my, um, I don't know, skill or the, the thing that I figured out early was just trust that I know what I'm doing. Go forward with this. This is my impulse. And, you know, art is very subjective. Some people like painting, some people like sculpture, some people like this and like that. So if you do a comedy show every week and then you decide this week we're going to do a dramatic piece yeah of course your audience isn't going to like it you haven't told them that this is something that they can do but there is an audience for that so um i don't know if i've answered your question but i i want to uh, feel like it, to me again that's part of the 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 philosophy of it is that um it's, it's about what your artistic um, in drive is or your intentions are for, for your improv. Mm -hmm. and, and then the other thing I'll, I'll often say is that just because it's dramatic doesn't mean it can't be funny. And just because it's funny doesn't mean it can't be dramatic. I mean, um, I was thinking about this, this old classic romantic comedy, Notting Hill. I don't know if you're familiar with Notting Hill. It's Julia Roberts and um, uh, Hugh Grant. And they're funny in it. They're not comedians. They're just like, ah, oh, these are amusing situations. But then they do have that one guy in it who's like, I'm the weird roommate and I never wear pants. And like, uh, so like you can have silly comedy within a romantic comedy and you can have laughter within a horror. Like, you know, so it, it's about your intention. And I think improvisers just get locked into we're just doing comedy or we're just doing drama. And um, one of the things that I think Crumbs was really great at was mixing the both. We could have really funny situations that were actually really dark and depressing, but the audience wanted to laugh to release some tension from how horrible the situation was. Mm. And I think that that really puts it um, to the point, it's that tension release. And a lot of people, um, improvisers, talk about that. It's, 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 a, it's a form of um, coping, right? It's a form of coping, especially with the awkward moments. But I think it's also those, the dramatic side is, is what people go away from really thinking about the piece for longer, because it's like they're, they're at the edge of the chair and they're, they're breathing with the improviser. You know, they're using those silences that really can have an effect on them to, to not know 
is this going to, is this really happening? Is this, is it, you know, and, and they're sort of so much more invested that it becomes part of their experience. And I think that's what sort of sticks with the memory in their body. They go away thinking, wow, that, that, that moved me. Um, and it was so awkward. So it was also like that tension release. It was a beautiful laugh when you finally got to laugh. It's, it's just so rewarding, both for the, you know, improviser, but also for the audience. It's absolutely rewarding. Um, yeah, I mean, um, I, as, a, as someone who's traveled and worked with so many groups, there's times when we show up, would show up in a place to do a, a theater sports show and they would have so many rules and it was rigid and we felt like we had to play their game. And then there was other places we would go to do theater sports where they said, be yourself, do whatever you want, want. take the, as many risks as you like. And so, so again, it's about like your, your philosophy as your group. And it's something that a lot of improv groups don't talk about is like, what does our, our final goal look like? And they kind of repeat the same things every week and they feel like we're not getting anywhere. And it's, again, they lock themselves into to these rules, regulations, definitions that in the long run um, tie them down to something mm -hmm. they really don't want to do. Mm -hmm. yep. um, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, can, I can, yeah. It's exactly that. I think, uh, you know, with, with one of my groups, you know, as well, the improv tantalizers, I always find that it's so beautiful to have that where we started off and, and used first we went to short form because we had such a difficult topic because it's all about kink and intimacy um, and how do you mix that with comedy that was the first intention like oh we can't laugh about these things if we're trying to take them seriously so there's already a oh we've got to start thinking about this and that's what i loved about it that you we sat down as a group and said okay what is it that we actually want what is our message with this um, because that will help you then understand of, of what you're trying to get. And then you can sort of start exploring what works with short form and where do we need maybe mid form. Um, maybe we could even have a long piece, but what does that mean for the audience with this theme? You know, and, and I think that's that's what exactly what you said is having groups that really think about what it is they want to show and understanding their audience. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And um, the 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 important thing uh, isn't the 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 t-shirts and the the stickers and um, the really great photo shoot uh, you know like these are the things that most improv groups kind of start to invest their money in right away and, and before they have a, a feeling or a statement or a thought and you know a lot of improv groups uh, aren't a punk rock band like I said they are uh, organizations with a lot of different people and the more people you have in a sense, the harder it can be to say, this is what our product is. And the, the groups that stand out to you, the groups that you remember, uh, made you feel something, regardless of whether it's dramatic, funny or whatever, you felt something. And I would probably venture to say that most of those groups have a clear idea of what their artistic vision is um, versus um, what the advertising should look like, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Advertising and, is important, it's just not the first thing. Yeah, and I think the courage also to change, they're not so worried about saying we're trying something new, but we trust our audience to, to, to explore that with us um, and not to always stick into that, oh, we, that, was so, that was such a great show, we're going to just sort of repeat that, you know, that style. Instead to be like, no, that was great, but let's still move on and take the audience with us, our fans with us and explore further because it is courageous and I think uh, it helps every... It helps both sides grow with each other, you know, to see that. It's not a failure if it doesn't make you laugh at one day, you know, it's not a failure. It's more where I say, wow, they tried something new. I'm loving this. I think it's brilliant when, when I see groups that have been out there for longer and they're trying new things, especially in Zoom times. I mean, everybody's been exploring so much with Zoom. I was, I was talking about this the other day and um, talking about um, some other um, well-known improv teachers and saying, um, I, don't, I don't want to learn from somebody who hasn't um, been in and looking around what's going on. I don't want to go to a doctor that hasn't read a medical journal since the 80s. I, I want to take a workshop with someone that is aware of what's happening and is interested in what's happening. And uh, sadly, as uh, some people get older, they feel like everything has been done. There's nothing else to do. So this is the way we keep doing it and have little to no experience of what's actually happening in the outside world. And when I say world, I mean the world, not just their city mm. um, or their own organization that they're working in. Right. And the, the amount of different shows and inspirations that are out there are endless and you have to find them. And sometimes people have really good ideas that they're not doing really well. And sometimes people have really terrible ideas, but they're such good performers, it looks really good. 
Um, so you've got to both figure out. <laughs> yeah, both is all right. I mean, you know, if you want to do improv once a month in a cafe for two people, great, do it, love it. Um, but if you want to step up and say like, we're one of the best, we're going to be uh, influential and we're going to eventually maybe even start being one of those teachers that travels the world teaching people, then you've got to figure out what it is you want to say that's different. Mm. Yep, I agree. All right. All right. Let's get, yeah, let's, let's, let's get down to this. Here. Should, we start, should we start the interview? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's start the interview. <laughs> we can talk like this for hours, but let's, let's, uh, let's get some interviews. Um, do you think there's a terminology difference between narrative improv and dramatic improv, or are they the same? Um, and, and I mean, there's, like I say, there's no right and wrong. It's just popped up so many times and, and everybody has that point of view. And I love this question. Um, yeah, I think improv is um, one of the worst um, groups of people, like improvisers in general, the worst uh, group of people for them defining something and then assuming that's what everyone else means by that definition. So if I make a definition of what I think narrative improv means, then I then argue with everyone else that that's not what, imp that's not what narrative improv is. So, um, you know, I just try to find the most simple explanation. Uh, again, to me, dramatic improv doesn't necessarily mean serious and not funny. Um, dramatic improv to me is more what we're, I mean, what I assume people mean is that we're creating honest characters that are more realistic and less um, uh, cartoon or less abstract things can happen in some ways. Um, and then in the sense of narrative, for me, that's always been more about storytelling and how we tell the story. Mm -hmm. um, now, again, these are my definitions. I'm not a dictionary. Um, I'm not uh, Shakespeare, so I'm not going to claim that these are the rules for everybody, but for me, that's what I've always thought of those two distinctions. One's more about storytelling and how we structure and tell our stories, and the other is more about the, um, the truth of the scene and, um, again, I use the word honesty, but just being realistic characters. Mm -hmm. Unru just vulnerable. Vulnerable and uh, showing all sides to to the characters yeah yeah mm -hmm. slowing down and mm -hmm. yes uh yes definitely no i i agree uh completely you've done it so beautifully so i won't need to argue it because no, I, but you, you also don't have to agree with me no i am um, no, no um i i argue with a lot of other people not I, I don't argue because there's no right and wrong if if you argue then you're trying to convince somebody i'm not i don't need to though because i agree with that but then we have worked a lot together so maybe it yeah, sense, right? I poisoned your mind too much. <laughs> It'd be good if we were always like, I don't know what you're talking about, Lee. What, what you talk about? I, I talk about different things, but we're not going to work today. It's just not going to work. Um, all right. Um, as you are, I, I have to ask this question, as you are also a cast member of uh, the show Duluth, mm -hmm. um, for you personally, would you like to highlight um, for our viewers, because uh, they're probably quite interested. Some of the highlights, um, of the big differences for you or that you see in the kind of style of soap improv, um, perhaps it's a technical one, you can, you can go in on that, but versus the just going on a show and having a long form. What for you are the major highlights or challenges? Um, well, um... When you, whenever you're doing a, a genre, um, it's important, I think, for the players to sort of, um, again, agree on what that looks like in the final uh, show kind of thing. Um, whereas I think the nighttime soaps are, generally speaking, kind of just coming back to what we were saying about the dramatic side, All more honest characters, more realistic things that are happening. And uh, I've, I've been really surprised with the cast in the sense of how much they're trusting to stay away from the comedy side of things, mm -hmm. which, I, which I thought would really be our, our biggest um, hurdle uh, for the, the performers is to stay away from that comedy side of things. Now, there, are, there have been some funny moments and there's also dark moments you can laugh at. You know, it's not like that it's humorless. Um, but at the same time, we're not... Um, it's not it's not jokes per minute 
We're not looking for jokes right. per minute. Right. Mm-hmm. But I think there, I think again, there is humor within the like, oh yeah, this is exactly what should happen in this crazy scene. Although maybe that will come as well, because sometimes once you get into that flow, and I think once we start airing, because it's all improvised, we don't know the plot, we don't know the narrative, it, we're all going to be doing this together, right? So we'll be endowing each other, things will happen, we'll be using it. And I think that's part of the journey to at some point when we start getting comfortable and we feel like, oh, this is a perfect scene, this, oh, we got to do this, right? You, you will feel that, I think, and then you will just zoom in the other person and be like, come on, let's, let's do the scene together, and you'll jump. And then you'll do exactly that, maybe, you know? If you, it's like a mind melt, but it's over Zoom and everybody's sort of seeing the same and it's like, this should be happening right now. Um, so we'll have to see how that goes. We will. You know? Um, yeah, and, and like with this project, there's so much technical uh, stuff attached to it, which for me is kind of a new thing, even though I've been doing some online slash Zoom shows. Um, this one's a bit more technically sort of uh, juggly. Oh. Kind of like working this on my computer, checking my phone, doing all these things to try to get, you know, a, a one minute scene to work. It's like, oh, there's so many steps just to, to... I think, yeah, go in on that lead with me because I think a lot of people, we, ha we haven't done really behind the scenes of Duluth and the thing. So what is actually, I think most people are like, oh, there's just another show because nobody's talking about, and now you're a cast member, I will with you take that opportunity. Talking about that, it's a lot to do with, it's OBS, right? We're doing this over OBS, Zoom, OBS, OBS is streaming it. You know, that's what's sort of making it televisionized, the way we're appearing. We don't want to- yeah. But but also don't say OBS like everyone knows what that means. Oh, <laughs> that's a good- <laughs> You know, hopefully my mom watches this and she's not gonna know what OBS, she's gonna think that's some female product that you use monthly or something. You know, OBS, what's, what's that? Um, maybe that wasn't appropriate. I apologize. My mother's a lovely person. The, the, my point is, is uh, what's OBS? Um, uh, OBS is basically, it's like a stream, yeah, it's like a stream channel. It's what the game is used for. I'm going to explain it easily you know, for, for people like your mother. Um, so it's basically a streaming, it's a streaming platform where in the background, it's very technical, you've got the directors, you've got the tech people sitting and they're the ones that are cutting like a television show, you know, to A to B, which actor do I want to see? Is the volume okay? Is the lighting okay? You know, doing all of this and deciding um, how that's going to be portrayed and then making sure that all of this technical part gets zoomed into, streamed into the YouTube channel. So uh, and thank God, you know, we're not the technicians of this. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's for, the, for the players, it is challenging because the style is, like you say, it's what suddenly we're practicing one minute scenes, right? Roughly a minute. And you've got a minute to come in with in objective, um, you know, your, your, your strong point of view, you sort of, the only thing you do know is roughly your character, right? Now how you might be feeling, what your name is, your age is, <laughs> why, why the hell you're in Duluth. And apart from that, nothing, you don't know anything. So it's really about getting everything across within a minute and you've got to share that minute as well. It's not just you. So it's very fast. Although a minute can be very long, depending how you set it up and what a pro you are, which you're a pro at. But at the same time, also the cast has to be careful of having that balance of a minute might be really long at moments, but it might be also way too short for other things. Because there's got to be tempo. There's got to be differences. You don't want to have all the scenes being sad and all the scenes being really happy. It's like we've got to figure out without talking to each other, hey, we need tempo now, you know, bring it up, bring it up. She's going to come onto scene with me. And we don't know this before either, do we? So we, we've got a chat, we've got a chat on the side technically and be like, next scene, who's up? Somebody's got a response straight away. You've got, we've got to do all the, I won't give it away, but all the background work straight away, get all that into the backgrounds, get it all set up. Um, the director has to be like, oh, who's up on stage? We have to get into some sort of green room. We have to, you know, be there, be ready. And we have sometimes only a minute, not even, to get that sorted out between the scenes. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's stress, like you said, it's stress for the, for the actors because you've got to watch the whole story whilst you're doing all of this. Costume change on top of it. <laughs> <Yes. What? laughs> I mean, <laughs> you... I'm, I'm very well known for my costume changes. This is <laughs> yeah. how I got famous in the first place. Yeah, exactly. And especially in this one, you'll be, you'll be using a lot of wigs, I hear, you know, so. <laughs> Yes, I, I refuse to play bald characters anymore. I've had enough of it. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's yeah, it's a lot to juggle. It's a lot to juggle, and um, you know, even though we've all been together now for you know almost two months, I guess um, uh, we're still getting to know each other. And uh, because the cast is so big, there's still people in the show that I haven't even done a scene with, or. Um, you know, we were in rehearsal the other day and 
I was doing a scene with someone and I was like, I don't even remember what your character does for a living. Like I, like there's 13 people. I got to remember what everybody does. And so, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it's a, it's a lot to keep in mind. It's, it's very different than a, a free form, long form mm -hmm. show for sure. Yes. This is the, for me, what I love the most is being able to, uh, what well, two things, the vision behind World Improv Network, right, which is to, to really get soaps out there and to start televisionizing or trying to televisionize improv as general, because I think once we get it out there, we have a bigger market of new people that actually understand the art form or might be interested in the art form and a dramatic side to it, not just a stand up comedy, which improv is pretty much known for in the world. It's always, if you say, oh, I do improv, they're all like, oh, comedy? And it's like, well, actually, well, yeah, a bit more, more dramatic, but it's interesting that everybody knows it under comedy. So this, this way they get to understand that there's so much more to it. You know, there's a whole theatrical side to it. Yeah, I mean, there's two sides to that, right? I mean, um, yes, everyone's association with it is, most people's association with it is, is the comedy side of things. Um, but part of the other problem is, is that if you were, just as an example, filming a movie that was a serious dramatic movie and you had a scene in it that was improvised, that's a side note for trivia 10 years later. Mm. No one is, is bragging about that on the day that the film is released. In fact, most uh, directors and film people don't even want anyone to know that it is improvised. So, you know, this is a bigger problem that can get sidetracked, but I mean, some of the more famous, let's call them Hollywood celebrities who grew up in improv, don't really respect the art form and talk about it in the way of an art form. They talk about it as this crappy little thing they used to do that helped them reach something else. Do you, do you think that, the, I, don't, I think it might have been in the 80s where it was still like 70s, 80s, but I think now um, when you look at the big stars, they do talk about it. I mean, we have some pretty big, like Will Ferrell. I mean, there's, there's people out there, right, that, have, that are serious with improv. Um, and they do talk about it. And I think it's shedding a new light. And I think that's also because we're getting more into the dramatic side or narrative side of things. People are starting to show that there's so much more and how complicated it is. And it's a bit like method acting. Method acting is part of the acting career. You've just got to go through it to understand it. And there might be some that say, oh, method acting is just not my thing. But improv is definitely part of those stepping stones as well for them. But I think a lot of people have trouble with improv. And, and that's the truth of it, because it's not easy. There is a lot of tools you need to at least try and get a grasp of as an actor. And to, to have the time to translate those into practice, it's not always so easy. So maybe a lot of them give up on it as well. Yeah, but I also, I think like if, um, if someone grows up within, you know, one organization of doing improv, their outlook doesn't go beyond those walls of that theater. So again, it just comes back to, you know, I, I don't want to like mention people's names who I think have been disrespectful to improv, but at the same time, like <laughs> there's definitely people who grew up in these kind of organizations like Second City or, or Improv Olympic, who again, just live in this bubble and have no idea what's happening outside of it. So even though they've gone on to do, um, I don't want to say more successful things, but I will say, let's say more uh, publicly known things through television or movies, their idea of what improv could be is still so limited because it's still based on that experience they had. And um, so it's, it's, it goes both ways. I think there, there are people that still respect improv, but again, uh, don't see it much more than uh, a comedy tool for writing sketches or a comedy tool for helping them get on to Saturday Night Live or some television show. But I mean, maybe this is a bigger, more depressing topic than you want. Well, to well, about. I love it, but it's exactly the reason why um, Pete Mosso, who's the producer of uh, of Duluth, um, and she, you know, that's why his vision is there because you know, he, and that's why he, you know, he he really caught my attention because he said he everything you said he pretty much sees as well, and he said, how about I want to push it. He said, I want to push it. So if they see that there's more dramatic side to the theatrical side, it's deeper than just the stand-up comedy side, then they understand how, how beautiful this art form can be and start appreciating it more. And it's not just us improvisers. I mean, there's a lot of improvisers out there in the world, apparently more than 7 million. But I think it's also like, we're not just twisting our mum's arms to come and watch it anymore. We're actually getting an audience out there possibly saying, I'm actually enjoying this. I see how difficult it is. It's amazing. I'm respecting it and I'm loving it. It's just, you know, watching characters develop over such a long period of time, being able to associate with them, being able to feel with them, go through that journey with them, um, which you also have a normal television. So we've got a lot to, to go up against, right, with improv, with this Duluth. Mm -hmm. But um, I think once they understand that it's all improvised, even the editor in the moment, there's no post-production. He's improvising. I mean, but it, sometimes I always say, like, are we really doing this? This is madness. You know, I mean, it's like such a big challenge because the amount of things that can go wrong is so probable. But that's the beauty of it, trying to get that to let's 
let's let's explore this and just get it to a level one show after the other that it just starts shining and that way who knows you know people might see it and be like we actually want to start putting money into this and getting loads out there and let's actually get some other stars involved in the acting world so that they can start and see maybe the you know the beauty of this and an upcoming improvisers to push that yeah, yeah. And, and finding uh, the audience, the, the market that wants to watch this. And I think we can find a, a bigger audience outside of that who aren't already um, locked in again to their vision of what improv is. Finding those people outside of right. that. Right. And I think exactly that. I think it's pushing improv to new boundaries. That's what I mean. Where, where else can improv go? And who, who else can find improv interesting apart from just the improv community? Get it out there. Because that's what we love, right? We do this because we want to get improv out there into the world and pushing. Where, where haven't we been with improv? Let's do this. Uh, that's well, awesome. personally, I think there's enough improvisers. We, do, we don't necessarily need more. <laughs> Stop. Nobody, nobody carry on. Stop. Yes. <laughs> don't, don't let any new students in from now on. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Lee, if there's one thing, um, the last question, and then, and then we've got to both go. One thing before... Um, you leave is there tips from you personally lee white the big lee white <laughs> you, you want to um pass on to your own cast and crew members who are all like biting their nails trying to get this right where you'd say these are tips um that i think would be really cool or tips for the audience that don't know what to expect either or please give them now um well, like I kind of said before, um, you know, it, it's been really fun for me to be a part of a project and not feel like uh, there's any more weight on my shoulders than any of the other actors. Um, so I, I, I don't want to uh, give tips in the sense of like the idea of like, you better do as I say, or this will fail. Um, but, but what I will say in general is that um, Every time that we get into a scene or um, every time you get into your character's shoes, um, want something and go for it. And I think that's the, the key for um, this sort of genre is that these are about people who are driven to get something. And part of the fun of it is that it's not Dallas, it's Duluth. It's a small town. So the things that we want can be a little bit more um, um, on the on the on the just regular human level. We're not millionaires. We're yeah. you know we're not. Um, and so, but but at the same time, all of our characters have to want something. And um, even if it's just what do I want for this scene, or what do I want for my character? What does my character want for their life? Um, and in those moments when we're flipping around and we're switching and we're trying to figure out where we are. Don't worry about what to say. Figure out what your character wants. What do I want from this person I'm in the scene with? And if, if you and I or whoever both have something, then we only need one thing. We don't need them both. But if you say yours first, I'm going to follow you and give it to you or keep it away from you, depending on what the, the scene is about. Um, but if, if we both take care of each other in that sense of saying, look, I'm going to have a, a character want for every scene, and then we'll see who comes out in the scene. You know, for me, I tend to try to give my partner more space to feel like they're pushing and driving and I just want to support, I just want to support. And I kind of created a character that can um, support everybody and yet still be... Don't, don't, little... don't, don't say it, don't say it, don't say it. They're gonna to have to watch it if they want to say, it. you have got a very interesting character. Uh, what you can say is what, what your character's called though and how you came to that name. <laughs> um, uh, so I had to pick a character that I felt that uh, if you don't know me and just visually see me, what does this guy do? And then I thought about Duluth, which isn't too far away in a sense from Winnipeg, where I grew up. And the one thing that uh, sort of stuck out to me was just a regular working guy. So in the winter, I, I shovel, I have a truck that removes snow. And in the summer, I tow, tow cars away when, you, when you're parking illegally. Um, so I'm, I'm Sully Babchuck. Yeah. Um, Sully uh, is just a good working man's name, and Babchuck sounds uh, like 
you know, um, I'm from a different country. My, my grandparents came over here and, and we're now just the Babchucks. I, I love last names and uh, hockey is one of the greatest places to get last names from. Hockey? Uh, yes, yes. If, if you want to have an interesting character last name, just look up who's playing hockey. And I sw like hockey last names are the best. Uh, Howard Chuck, uh, Bab Chuck, um, Kaminsky, Kowalski, you know, like they've, they've got all of these weird names that sound far away. And then, you know, even still you get like the, the Norwegian names, you know, the Lindstrom's. And you, so like, if you need a last name, just Google, <laughs> Google ho who's the top 10 hockey players right now. Uh, and you'll get a, a wonderful list of, of names. So I wanted a colorful name that sounded like the everyman and yet also sounded silly enough that you'd remember it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You definitely have that. Excellent. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, and I wish, I wish you would have argued a little bit when I said I couldn't be a brain surgeon. You were just like, yep, yeah, that's true. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, no, but kidding. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have. I would have told you, really, you know me, I'm really blatant. I'm really honest. I, I will say what I, what I feel. I, know. I, I yeah. will. In a show, I can be a brain surgeon. The audience within the theater world is willing to put that imagination in. It's just harder on screen, and I didn't want to wear a lab coat. Uh, I, I don't think, it, I don't know why, I feel like I need to say this. I don't think it suits you. To be a brain surgeon? <laughs> yeah, well, that's... that's great. Lee, I thank you so much uh, for your time, and um, I am looking forward to, to playing with you. Um, for this great experiment in the future on other projects and you are wonderful keep going at the rate um i hope that soon the pandemic's over for you so you will be in your normal state booked out till you can't even think anymore on the one hand i do want that for you on the other hand i'm quite selfish and i don't because then i don't get to see you so much anymore <laughs> Well, I, I honestly don't think I'm going to stop online stuff, even if the pandemic uh, ends. And then, um, so I really enjoy being able to teach people from all over the place who can't come to Berlin or aren't going to be able to go to a festival where I'm at. So I probably want to continue some of that on some level. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, I do teach a little bit through the gorillas. I also have my uh, website. It's leewhite.com. You can go there and uh, I'll have some new classes and stuff up there. Um, but I'm on Facebook. People can add me and ask me questions about improv. Uh, just make that clear. Um, and, uh, <laughs> yes, and, make and, yeah. that clear. Most people don't dare for some reason. You have experienced that most people, they, um, because you are very big, right? When, then when most people see you at improv festivals, you, we've heard you say very often i've heard you say very often they seem to be um a bit intimidated by you and then they feel like oh you're you're such a big star and they, they feel like they can't add you they can't just be human and, and ask you questions right so but you're the opposite you, you're like it's one of those things of like uh I'm, I'm a lot more shy than i than i act and so when i get to the festival and, and the show's over then i just try to sit in a corner with my wine and 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 then everyone thinks that that's saying, oh, stay away from him. And really, it's more me saying, I'm too scared to go up to people and talk to them. Um, so if, if you see me sitting there and, uh, and I look like I'm, I'm angry or I'm not having fun, uh, that means you're allowed come to come and talk to me. Means, yeah. Yeah. Come, come entertain me. Yes, <laughs> that's what it means. Get on my table and dance. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, excellent. Lee, uh, like I say, I will put as well all the links under the video so they can get hold of you. Um, see you very, very soon. And thank you so much. My pleasure. I hope this was interesting. And if not, we can try it again later. We I should... can <laughs> learn from my mistakes. Uh, we, should just, uh, we can dance it out. Just do another dancing you know, session of um, rocking some beats. All right. A pleasure. Bye bye. Thank you. Come to Duluth. Duluth, come watch Duluth, exactly. <laughs> Subscribe. <laughs> Smash the like button. On the YouTube channel, the Win YouTube channel, World Improv Network. <laughs> right, we've done all the advertising. Let's get right. out. <laughs>